seated. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we're over in Acts tonight, looking at Acts chapter 9, verses uh, 23 through 25. Very interesting as it follows directly on the heels of confounding the Jews in verses 19 through 22, which reads, And when he had received meat, this is immediately after Saul's conversion, he was strengthened. Then Saul was certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the privilege of once again coming together to study your word, this immense precious treasure that you have entrusted to us. You have given us the written word of God. You have given us the word of God, your Son. Marvelous gifts to us, a sinful group of human beings, and yet you have given us the word that we might know you, the true and living God. And also that we might learn to trust you, that we might learn to walk by faith, that we might understand the importance of the fellowship of the saints, of believers gathering together one another. How we pray, Father, that there might be more here with us tonight. How we pray that you would cause all of those connected with this church to have an earnest hungering and thirsting and desiring not only for your word, but for the fellowship of believers, which was so important to the Apostle Paul here in Damascus at the beginning of his ministry, and then for his rescue and for his escape when others sought to kill him. Father, we pray for your blessings on the going forth of your word tonight, 
that it will not return unto you void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall that last week we learned ten different principles, very quickly summarized in just a moment, but ten principles that help us to understand what God does for us when he calls us and sends us forth into service. Number one, we saw that the first thing that God did was provide the necessary physical strength. When he had received meat, he was strengthened. The second thing we saw was God provides the necessary stability of fellowship with other believers. If you try to go it on your own, you will be in serious trouble. We see that Saul was certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. The third thing we learned last week was that God designates the battlefront to which we must go. In Paul's case, God sent him to the synagogues. That was where he was qualified to minister. That was where he was prepared to answer all the questions. That was the group of people that already had a twisted and warped view of the Old Testament law, and Paul was prepared to answer their questions. He was uniquely prepared even before he was saved by the training that God gave to him. The fourth thing that we learned out of the text was that God will always give the specific message we are to preach. Straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. The fifth thing that we learned was that God awakens the specific audience that hears the message. And he awakens them in two different ways. Some believe and some reject. The sixth thing we learned was that God empowers a powerful testimony which is always focused on Christ. Your testimony has no power if it is focused on you, if it is focused on sad stories, if it's focused on funny events. It only has the power of the Spirit of God if it is focused on Christ. The seventh thing that we learned last week as we looked at that text was God gets the attention of those who see a change in our lifestyle. You no longer do the things that you used to do. The people are amazed because they said, isn't this the fellow who destroyed people that called on the name of Christ in Jerusalem? And he came here to do the same thing. His life was changed. When you trusted Christ, we asked that question last week, how did it change your life? How did it change your life? God takes you as you are, but he never leaves you as you are. When you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it makes a radical change in your lifestyle, and others who knew you before now will see the difference. The eighth thing that we learned was that God causes spiritual growth, spiritual strength, and gives spiritual abilities for spiritual warfare. And we went through that text in Ephesians 6, which we also referenced this morning, about the spiritual warfare to which God has called us. He always equips us and always gives us the strength to fulfill the warfare that he has called us to engage in. Number nine, God always provides irrefutable proof of the truth of the message he gives. That last phrase in verse 22, proving that this is the very Christ. Irrefutable proof, but it based on the scripture. If you do not know the scripture, you will not be able to offer the proof. And the tenth thing that we learned is that thus the Christian life is a life of apologetics, a life of defending the faith, refuting gainsayers, offering irrefutable proof from scripture of the truth of the gospel, the claims of Christ, and of accountability before God, and of judgment coming. We see Paul arguing those things as he stands before Felix, and Felix trembles when he hears the Apostle Paul speaking of Christ. So tonight we move down to verses 23 through 25. We've entitled the message, A Basket Case. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and, he wa and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. <laughs> 
If you didn't get it in the first verse, you get it in the second verse. The point is they want to kill him. We will kill this fellow. Have you ever had anyone who wants to kill you? Oh, there may have been some who were so mad they said, I could kill you for that. But who really wanted to kill you? Now, sometimes they might have wanted to kill you because you did something very evil. But if they wanted to kill you because your testimony for Christ is so irrefutable, they can't take it any longer. And if they will not believe, the only thing they can do to stop your testimony is to rub you out. There have been many martyrs in the history of the church where those who hated them hated them for one reason and one reason only. They proclaimed Christ and the gainsayers could not refute them. There are Christians today in India who are being killed not because they are nasty mean people but because they proclaim the name of Christ. There are Christians in the Muslim countries all over the world, all the way from Indonesia to Saudi Arabia, who are being killed for one reason and one reason only, because they proclaim the name of Christ. It may someday and perhaps soon be the case in the United States where we, as persona non gratia, are killed because we proclaim the name of Christ. Well, the compromisers will be able to get by, but those who are in position of leadership going into the forefront of the battle will be targeted by the enemy. The enemy always targets those who are leading the charge. You know that during the various wars in which America has participated, that the officers never wear their bars and stars because they are immediately the objects of the enemy's rifles. Twice it tells us that their purpose, their goal, was to kill Paul. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. We learn a number of very important principles from these three very short verses that are before us tonight. The first principle is that God determines the length of ministry in each place where we serve. God determines the length of ministry in each place where we serve. The Apostle Paul always went with a mind to remaining in each place where God put him for as long as God would have him in that place. Here we find the Apostle Paul having a wonderful ministry in Damascus. He wins all the arguments. Many people come to Christ. He has a great time of fellowship with other believers. It's a strong and healthy church. It is a place where obviously God had sent him and where he had trusted Christ, where he had received salvation, a place dear to his heart, a place where he had been baptized, a place where the Apostle Paul had a ministry that was a thriving ministry. But God saw fit to bring that ministry to an end. He brings ministries to ends in many different ways. Sometimes it's through persecution, as we see taking place here in this passage. Sometimes he brings ministry to an end when a church dies. It simply no longer ceases to exist. Sometimes he brings a ministry to an end when God places a burden upon a man's heart to go to another place as Paul had that Macedonian call, come over here and help us. We never know what God will do tomorrow. Our responsibility is to be obedient in whatever ministry, large or small, God has placed us today. Every one of you are ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of you, regardless of the sphere or the scope of your ministry, has a ministry to testify to Christ and to serve him. That's what ministry means. Unfortunately, the American church today has come to the wrong conclusion that ministry and ministers are those guys who stand up in the pulpit and who have had theological training and so the job is theirs, and they dump the entire job on the ministers. 
But our Lord Jesus Christ has given to each one of us a ministry, that is, a position of service. Now, those of you who were with us when we studied the spiritual gifts know that we talked about the gift of ministration, which is a gift of service. It is an every believer gift. It is the responsibility of each one of us to be aware of the place that God has placed us and then to be aware of the people with whom we have contact and how we may minister to them. Are you fulfilling your ministry? Are you fulfilling your calling? Are you fulfilling the obligation that God has placed upon you through the giving of the spiritual gifts that he has given to each one of you who have trusted Christ? Very important principle. God determines the length of ministry in each place where we serve. Have you had a job promotion? You suddenly have a new ministry. Have you lost your job and gotten a new job? You suddenly have a new place of ministry. Where is it that God has put you now? Are you in retirement? Do you have contact with other people? That's the ministry God has given to you. Are you in this church? Are there people here that you know who need help? That's your ministry. Where has God placed you? What does he want you to do? He will determine the length of that ministry because he determines your health. He determines your location. He has determined your time in history. He has determined your gifts. And someday each of us will give an account for the ministry that he has entrusted to us. The second thing that we learn as we look at these three short verses is that sometimes the very ones we are sent to reach harden their hearts to a point of no return. Did you know that God sometimes sends you to minister to a people who will not respond? Read the book of Jeremiah, for example. God says to him, Jeremiah, I chose you before you were born. I decided where I was going to send you while you're still a little teeny child. I'm sending you to this people here, P.S. They'll have a hard heart and reject your message. Sometimes God sends us in our ministries to people whom God's only purpose is for them to hear the word so that upon rejecting the word, they will come under judgment. It's the doctrine of reprobation. God told that to Jeremiah. Look at Moses, for example. We find that Moses goes to Egypt and Moses preaches before Pharaoh. As we read the text, we discover that seven times out of ten, it says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The other three times, it tells us, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Same message. We see an active involvement by Pharaoh, so he is accountable, but we see a sovereign God controlling the situation, for God had determined that he would bring his people out of Egypt with a high hand. God sometimes sends us to those who will harden their heart so that God can judge. Paul makes a point of that in Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, where he specifically tells us that Pharaoh was raised up for one specific purpose. That particular baby was born at that particular time in history with that particular education, background, and all the things that went into making a Pharaoh so that at precisely the right time, God would raise up Moses to preach to Pharaoh that God might judge Pharaoh. That's the magnificent, powerful God that we serve. But you know, Moses was not only sent to preach to Pharaoh, Moses also was sent to lead the children of Israel. And how many times we read in the text where Moses comes before God in utter frustration and says, Lord, these are not my children, they're your children. I'm not the mother of these kids. <laughs> Why should I have to take care of them any longer? 
Moses, who stood before the children of Israel each time they murmured and griped and complained in the wilderness. Ten times they did so until God finally said, you're going to die in the wilderness and I'll let your children inherit the land. These people of Israel, who Moses goes up on the mount to receive the Ten Commandments, and what do they do with Aaron? Moses' brother, down in the plains. They make a golden calf and worship it. These people who, when they're in the wilderness and they don't have any water, they gripe and complain against Moses and they want to kill Moses. God provides money, uh, provides the water necessary for them in the wilderness. Yes, Moses many times faced the wrath of a people who did not want to obey God. Just remember, sometimes the very ones that we are sent to reach harden their hearts to the point of no return. That happened to Pharaoh. That happened with the adult generation of those who left the land of Egypt. The third thing that we discover as we look at this text is that God can uncover the most hidden plans of the enemy when it suits his purposes. It says, but their plan was, was known to Paul, was known to Saul. How did he find out? What method did he use to discover this plot that they were going to kill him? You know, we talked a little earlier as we were looking at the book of Acts about the spy network that was going on. There was a spy network that the believers had very clearly because they even knew before Paul arrived in Damascus that he had been sent by the high priest to catch them. Ananias says so as he's arguing with the Lord Jesus Christ. When Christ comes and says, look, go to the street called Straight, uh, inquire at the house of one called Judas, you'll find a guy there by the name of Saul, and uh, he has seen a vision that somebody's going to come and lay hands on him so he'll receive his sight. And Ananias says, Lord, I've heard by many about this man, Saul. So his reputation had come before him. But he says, how that he's received letters from the chief priest to come here to Damascus. Now listen, Paul had just arrived in Damascus. But Ananias already knew about what had happened in Jerusalem and why Paul was in Damascus. The believers had some kind of a communication network and perhaps that was what took place here in this situation where now they have communicated to Paul those hidden plans. Maybe it was some other way, we're not told. Acts, of course, was written when whatever that method was would have still been useful to the believers. In any case, it says their laying in wait was known to Saul. Their laying in wait was known to Saul. So God can uncover the most hidden plans when it suits his purposes. We find two other passages in Acts where we see hints of this kind of thing. In Acts chapter 21 and Acts chapter 23, it says, and the seven days were almost ended. This is Paul has come back to Jerusalem. He has been paying his vows in the temple. He has taken other men with him who have a Nazarite vow into the temple. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, Damascus is up toward Asia, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people and laid hands on him crying out, men of Israel, help, this is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place. And further brought Greeks into the temple and hath polluted this holy place, for they had seen before him, with him in the city Trophimus, an Ephesian, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. Paul got to Jerusalem. A man who had worked for the high priest, a man whom everyone knew, was supposed to be catching and killing Christians and for seven days nobody touched him. Interesting. Interesting how God placed a protective hand but on the very last day as Paul was finishing up his vows he's in the temple suddenly someone cries out help! And all the city was moved and the people ran together and they took Paul and drew him out of the temple and forthwith the doors were shut. And as they went about to kill him, <laughs> here we're back to the same theme that we had up in Damascus. 
Tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. They were going to beat him to death. Interesting. They're still determined to kill Paul. But God protects Paul. You know, one of the things that was mentioned by one of the popes during the Reformation is to how much he hated the Protestants and how much he hated the Catholics. He said, you know, the thing that I most fear is facing one of these Protestants in battle because they know that when they're in the center of God's will, nothing can touch them. And they fight fearlessly. <laughs> you see, when you understand the sovereignty of God, you understand that your life is in his hands. You understand that nothing can touch you unless it is the very specific will of God. It's not a reason to act foolishly. It's not a reason to do things stupidly. It's not a reason not to take an escape when it's available, as we see Paul himself, or Saul at this point, doing in this text by going over the, bas over the wall in a basket. But we have absolute confidence, as we spoke of this morning, because the Lord is the man of war. The Lord is his name. The Lord is our standard. Jehovah Nissi. The banner that goes before us, he himself is the one who leads us into battle. Christ is the one who leads those on white horses in Revelation. We see him as the indefeatable leader of the believers. When it is his will, we live. When it is his will, we die. And nothing can touch us and cause our death any sooner than it is within the purposes of the will of God. We find another passage over in Acts chapter 23, and again we find some kind of a, a secret communication network going on. And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, of course he's brought them down, uh, Paul down to be heard by the Sanhedrin, Paul cries out, I am a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee, about the question of the resurrection is why I'm being called in question here today, and the Pharisees begin to say, hey, if God or a spirit has spoken to this guy, he's okay, leave him alone. The Sadducees, who didn't believe in the resurrection, said, no, we don't believe that at all, and there was a fight and they started to pull on Paul, and the chief captain comes down to rescue Paul. It says, he commanded to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Verse 11, very interesting, because it's the reason Paul makes a decision later on in the book of Acts. The night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, that's where God sent him in his ministry after Damascus, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. I think that is the reason that Paul later appeals to Caesar. <laughs> Number one, it gets him a free ticket to Rome. He doesn't have to pay for ship uh, boarding uh, as he uh, goes off, but he appeals to Caesar because God is going to take him and place him at the foot of the head of the Roman Empire. A man who will hear the gospel and who will not believe, even as Pharaoh heard the word of God from the mouth of Moses and did not believe. Don't get discouraged in the ministry that God gives to you. There will be those who hear it and who did not believe, but God has a purpose in having it be heard. Listen on. And when it was day, this is right after Paul has received that word from God, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had put Paul in jail. No. <laughs> There's one theme throughout all of this, until they had killed Paul. Do you understand the malevolent hatred of Satan and his forces. 
Do you understand how much he hates the gospel? How much he hates those who have believed the gospel? How much he desperately hates those who are effective in their Christian testimony? They would neither eat nor drink. They placed a curse upon themselves that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. I don't think any of us, at least I don't think so, have any enemies that are that serious about our testimony. And there were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. It's more people than we've got here tonight. <laughs> Can you imagine 40 vicious men who are members of some kind of a mafia group determined to rub out one man. Can you imagine 40, more than 40, vicious types determined to rub you out as you walk out the doors of this church? They could cover every door and every window in this building. They could put a couple of guys in front of each one of those outside doors, and the minute that you walk through the door, they blow you away with machine guns. That's what Paul is facing here. Did you know that at the time of Christ and in the early days of the church, the high priest at Jerusalem had a band of men called Sicarii. They were men who were political assassins. They were trained professionals in the art of killing people. They were given their name by a special kind of small curved knife that they would carry and they would surround a man in a crowd. They would, seven or eight of them, stab him and quietly walk away as his body fell to the pavement. We're dealing with some very nasty individuals here. And 40 have taken an oath that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. And they were in league with the high priests. They came to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now can you imagine a church whereby... There's somebody that the church leaders don't like. And so they are in cahoots, and they're not going to turn them in to the police. A group of men come to one of their board meetings, come to the meeting of the elders, come to the, the meeting of the trustees, come to the meeting of the deacons. And they say, we, we have something important to tell you because we know you want to get rid of somebody. We've decided to take it on ourselves to help you solve your problem. It's hard for us to imagine that anybody, any group of church leaders would say, man, we're going to have to call the police on this one. The chief priests and the scribes went along with the plot. In fact, they were happy about this plot. We got some guys on our side here. But notice, God made it known to Paul. Now therefore, signify the counsel, uh, ye with the counsel signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him, and we, or ever ye come near, are ready to kill him. Get the theme? To kill him. <laughs> not to beat him up, not to teach him a lesson, not to take him someplace and leave him marooned on a, a desert island. They were going to kill him. Verse 16, and when Paul's sister's son, that's Paul's nephew, heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. Now, how did this kid find out about the conspiracy? It's Paul's sister's son. It's not just some unnamed individual. It's somebody in Paul's family that hears about this. I mean, who knows, one of the conspirators or perhaps one of the servants of the Sanhedrin overhearing the plot 
may have been Saul's brother-in-law. I mean, think about that. Saul's sister had a son. The sister had a husband. The husband might have been one of the conspirators. He might have been saying to the sister, you better keep your mouth shut or you're dead meat too. And the little boy overheard it. We don't know what the situation was, but God has his way of uncovering the most hidden plans when it suits his purposes. Remember, that's what we're learning out of this particular portion of the text. We don't know anything else about the sister and the nephew other than this verse, but it does shed some light on the fact that Paul had a family life. We get to verse 17. Then Paul called one of the centurions unto him and said, Bring this young man unto the chief captain, for he hath a certain thing to tell him. Now, you know, I have gone on visitation to jails to visit various people who have been in jail. And there is a protocol before you can go and talk to the head of the jail. There's a protocol before you can even go and talk to one of the prisoners. God opened doors. Because this was a message that had to get to the chief captain immediately. I can remember going many, many years ago up in North Jersey when I was a pastor up there. One of the ladies in the church had, had a son who was in jail. I had to be interviewed first by the so-called chaplain of the jail where he was located. The guy was an apostate Episcopalian so-called minister. He sat there smoking a cigarette and blowing smoke rings in my face as he was talking to me before he would grant me permission, although I was a minister, and he knew the church that I was the pastor of, before he would allow me to go in and see this guy for five minutes and talk to the fellow through this window kind of thing. The fellow sat on one side and I sat on the other side. And there was no way to pass stuff in between. And a guard was standing over in one corner, you know, watching what was going on, though the conversation was theoretically, you know, a private conversation. But Paul was able to have his nephew come in and then was able to tell the guard, take this young man to see the chief captain without having to tell the guard first. Do you think God can open doors? when he wants to open doors? Do you think he can do it within the time that is necessary to get the job done? We clearly see so here in this situation. Then the chief cook captain took him by the hand, he was obviously a little kid, and went with him aside privately and asked him, what is it that thou hast to tell me? And he said, and he got it right, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldst bring down Paul tomorrow into the council as though they would inquire somewhat of him more perfectly. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. There's our theme again. And now are they ready, looking for a promise from thee. So the chief captain then let the young man depart and charged him, See thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. And as you know, the chief captain makes arrangements so that before they can come and ask him, and thus raise suspicion if he doesn't let him go, he makes arrangements to get Paul out of there and get him to Caesarea. You know, the devil and his minions spend a lot of time and money and energy to stop the proclamation of the gospel. It says, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. This is back to Damascus now. They watched the gates day and night. They had a 24-hour vigil going on to make sure that Paul didn't slip out of the city. They were wasting a lot of man hours. They were wasting a lot of money and time. Those were guys who were not at work that day. They were not getting paid for whatever job that they did. They wasted a lot of energy. They were staying up all night long. And they had a deadline, no hamburgers and Cokes until Paul was dead. I think they probably would have held a celebration feast if they had actually succeeded in killing Paul. Remember, they had bound themselves under a curse. As a practical matter, either they broke their oath or they starved to death. We don't know what happened to them. God doesn't tell us 
It's not important for us to know whether they broke their oath and went ahead and said, well, Paul must have gotten away, so let's go back and have dinner. They had bound themselves under a curse. Maybe some of them starved to death. We don't know. There are those even today who go on starvation diets to prove a political point. We see it all over the world. You read about it in the newspaper every now and then. I want to say something here about oaths. It's very important that we as Christians understand this. There are many oath-bound societies still in existence today, like the Masonic Lodge. It is a very dangerous thing, and contrary to Scripture, to be part of an oath-bound society. Perhaps someday we'll have time to spend on that subject, but most oath-bound societies take very serious blood oaths, whereby they swear to be killed if they reveal the secrets of the society. In masonry, there are oaths about you know, slitting their throats and plucking out their hearts and you know, throwing them at the ebb tide of the sea and all that kind of thing, if they ever reveal any of the secrets of the society. Most societies have those kinds of oaths. In the United States, there are approximately 800 so-called secret societies. According to one of the sources that I've read, more than um, half of the adult men and women in the United States belong to one or more of those 800 different secret societies. The fact that they're known, of course, demonstrates that they're not really secret. The fact that many people who were formerly members of those societies and then have left their lodges after salvation, revealing the oaths and the secrets also demonstrates that they are not really secret. Probably there are some which nobody knows about that are truly secret. But God, as in our text, has a way of revealing the evil secrets of men. Jesus said, For there is nothing hid which shall not be manifested, neither was anything kept secret but that it should come abroad. Mark 4.22, Luke 8.17, we hear the same thing. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. All the so-called secrets will be made manifest. And Paul tells us that those are the things, the evil things of the heart that will be made manifest as well. By the way, just as an aside, are you aware of the fact that Mormonism has almost identical oaths, identical secret handshakes, and identical signs to the Masonic Lodge? Mormonism. Dear people, getting involved in an oath bound society puts you squarely in the midst of a cult. Be very, very careful. A Christian should renounce all oaths that he has taken to an oath-bound society and leave it immediately. It is not something that you should be involved in. All right, back to our text. They had made themselves, they had put themselves under an oath and they had added to it a curse of what would happen to them if, in fact, they revealed any of those things. By the way, because of biblical prohibitions against swearing an oath, United States law, both federal and state, permits a person who believes the Bible to affirm rather than to swear an oath in court. In other words, you can avoid all the words, all the signs, and all the symbols of an oath. It's based on the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the application of those words by the Apostle James. Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37. Again ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Now, listen to what Jesus says. That's what you guys think. That's what used to be everybody, you know, goes along with that idea. You make an oath, you better keep your oath. But here's what Jesus says. But I say unto you, swear not at all. Neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, that's an affirmation, or nay, nay, that's a negation. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. I don't know how Jesus could say it any more plainly than that. He is prohibiting the swearing of an oath. 
Listen to how James summarizes it. In fact, James says this is the most important thing for you to learn in this passage that James is speaking in. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be nay, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Those guys were in serious trouble because Paul got away. Either they had to break their oath, which brought a curse on them, or they had to starve themselves to death. Dear people, avoid oaths. That's not just you know, saying bad language. That's taking upon yourself a curse if you break a promise. Our enemy, the devil, and his people are not ashamed to work together with religious people who are unsaved. That's what we see going on in the text. I mean, here are these assassins working with the religious leaders. And I think this church especially probably remembers the days of Dr. McIntyre and the war against the World Council of Churches, which was working hand in glove with the communists in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Still is, but it's not so overt now. There are other issues that are out there like sodomy and so on which they're getting into as well. Religious leaders in apostate denominations will always work with the devil. Number nine, God always has creative ways of protecting his people that are beyond the small imaginations of the enemy. We see here them watching the gates and, <laughs> and the disciples that fall down over the wall by night in a basket. God has creative ways of protecting his people that are beyond the small imaginations of the enemy. And notice also, God usually uses his own people to resolve the problems that are experienced by believers. We were talking about how God provides with Jehovah Jireh, God who sees and he sees with a, a goal of providing the needs of his people. How does God usually do that? He usually do, does that through his people. We found that the New Testament tells us that if you see a brother or sister in need and only say to them, be warmed and filled, what does that do for their body? You see, God distributes to each of us a certain amount of material goods and wealth. And we are not owners, we are stewards. And our responsibility is to use what God has given us to help the brethren, one of the many areas of our stewardship, when we see a brother or sister in need. Even so here, God uses his people to resolve problems like this experienced by other believers, although he's free to use other means. Remember one famous incident of avoiding the gates by means of a wall. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went, and they came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. It was no accident that that was the particular house that they came to, because Rahab was one of God's elect. Rahab was somebody that God was going to use in a very special way, not just at that moment in time, but down in history. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which be entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them and said, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whether the men went, I wot not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way of Jordan under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate. And before they were laid down, she came up unto them on the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom he utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God 
He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, Our life for yours if you utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. Then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. God had used this method of escape before. All the way back to the days of Joshua. She let them down over the wall. And then she bound a line of scarlet thread in the window so that they would know where her house was located and all the children of Israel would know. But you know, when the city fell down, God already knew, and that's the part that didn't fall down. <laughs> Can God protect and provide his people when they're doing his will? You know, Rahab was a believer. She declares it here, and... Hebrews 11 lists her as a hero of faith. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Not only was she a believer, but she was delivered with her family in Judges chapter 6 when Jericho fell. We find Joshua speaking, And the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she sent them hid the messengers that we sent. We jump down to verse 22. Joshua had said unto the two men that spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house and bring out thence the woman and all that she hath as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. Rahab had been busy running around and quietly gathering her family members. Something interesting about that, that means that they believed also. That means that they were also quiet about the issue that Rahab had hidden the spies. There's another incident in the Old Testament where a man was fleeing a city and there were those who did not believe of his family who perished. The man's name was Lot. He had married daughters and his sons-in-law scoffed when he told them God had warned him to flee the city. They laughed at him. So his married daughters and his sons-in-law perished. We find so many illustrations in Scripture where God provides a way of escape, and there are some who take it, and there are some who did not. And then we find in verse 24 and following, And they burnt the city with fire and all that was therein, only the silver and the gold, and the vessels of brass and of iron, they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive, and her father's household, and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Do you know the plans that God had for Rahab? We discover those plans in Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, the one who was the ancestor of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. God placed Rahab in the messianic lineage because she believed God. And she was willing to risk her own life because she believed God. 
Now back to Damascus. Here are believers who are taking care of Saul, whom before they had feared. And they risk their lives to let Saul down in a basket over the wall of Damascus, even as Rahab had let down the spies over the wall in Jericho. We don't know what blessings God gave to them. Isn't it interesting? God chose to tell us about Rahab because she would be in the Messianic line. But the believers at Damascus who saved the life of Saul, we won't know until we get to eternity. I may not know what blessing God will bring to your life because you have obeyed God. You may not know what blessing God has brought to my life because I have obeyed God. But someday in eternity, as we cast our crowns before the feet of the Lamb, then I think we'll know and we'll give the praise and the glory to him who redeemed us with his blood, the scarlet line that we see in the window of Rahab extending through the history to the scarlet stream of blood that ran from the body of Christ. Dear people, learn to obey. We have final three points. I'll move through them quickly. God always works out the perfect timing necessary to accomplish his goals. It was perfect timing. There was nobody around when Saul got let down in the basket. The road outside the city was clear. There was nobody on the wall looking down and seeing a guy going over in a basket. God always works out the perfect timing for any time he wants to deliver us, and so there is no need for us ever to panic. Second, God can blind the enemy into looking the other way. You know, we see many illustrations throughout history. For Some of you have read God's Smuggler about Brother Andrew and about how God blinded the eyes of various guards so that they did not see that he was bringing Bibles into Iron Curtain countries. We don't have time for those illustrations tonight. And finally, there is no shame in taking the way of escape that God provides. You are not required to be macho, you are only required to be obedient. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you for the illustrations from Scripture that you give to us concerning the responsibilities that we have before you and how we can trust you in every situation to meet our needs. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Father, how we thank you for the promises of your word. In Jesus' name, amen.